believing as Christians that God will ultimately put evil in its place. We still have to venture out into a world that has a whole lot of scary stuff in it. It is not bigger than God, but it is bigger than us. And for that reason, we need all the help we can get. We need to put on the full armor of God, beginning with the belt of truth. All week long, I've been wondering how you buckle the belt of truth around your waist and what it means to do so. Some people seem to think of truth as a weapon, that if they have it in their hand, they can cut through all the lies they hear in the world around them. But a belt is not a sword. It's not a weapon of offense. It is a weapon of defense. I think you wrap it around your middle to protect yourself from those lies that other people throw in your direction. When they say things like, nobody loves you. You're not very important. You don't really matter. Those are lies, aren't they? You are a precious child of God, and the belt of truth will remind you of that even on your worst day. But we also need to put on the breastplate of righteousness. It's hard to know exactly what the writer means by this, if he's talking about the righteousness of God or if he is talking about our righteousness. If it's God's righteousness, it means that power God has that makes us right. And that is a powerful breastplate to put on. It means that when we stand before God on the day of judgment, His righteousness will be our breastplate. If it's our righteousness the writer is talking about, it may be as simple as doing the right things, the things God has called us to do. If you are driving the speed limit, you don't have to worry when you see the police car by the side of the road. If you are doing what your boss asks you to do, then when she pops in unannounced, you don't even flinch. The breastplate of righteousness may only mean that you are busy doing what God wants you to do, and you know it. So that all these complaints, these criticisms, these false accusations people throw in your direction bounce off and fall to the ground. You are morally invincible. But then the writer of Ephesians tells us to put on the shoes of the gospel, which leaves us scratching our heads. Because if these are combat boots intended for spiritual warfare, they are the oddest combat boots ever made. How do you go to war in the shoes of the gospel of peace? Some of the best translations of this verse say, Put on your feet whatever will make you ready to share the gospel. And maybe that's what the writer is trying to tell us. If we spend all our time on defense, protecting ourselves against the lies that people hurl in our direction, the false accusations they throw, we will never go forward on defense. Offense. We will not remember that God has sent us into the world to preach the gospel, to make disciples of every nation. Put on your feet, the writer says, those shoes that will carry you forward so that even when the devil is doing his worst, you remember why you're there. If you were under constant attack, you might forget your mission. You might be so busy dodging the insults and accusations of the enemy that you would fail to share good news with someone who needed to hear it. So lace up those shoes that help you carry the gospel of peace to a needy world and then take up the shield of faith. That could mean a lot of things too, but I'm thinking especially about what it means when you find yourself under spiritual attack. It means you can believe in God. The opening verse of this passage tells us to be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power, not ours. His is a power we can believe in, a power that will help us stand even when the flaming arrows of the evil one are raining down upon us. We are not going to win spiritual battles by our own strength, but by His. It could mean even more than that, of course. It could mean that you believe in what you're doing. If you're trying to carry the gospel across enemy lines, then you're not going to let a few flaming arrows stop you. You're going to stay true to the mission you were given, trusting God to protect you as you go. But just to be on the safe side, you might put on the helmet 
of salvation. Martin Luther used to say when he was under spiritual attack, I have been baptized. He would say it out loud so the devil could hear it. I have been baptized. It was his way of reminding evil that he was wearing the helmet of salvation, that he had been saved by God's grace through his faith in Jesus Christ. And even if evil did its worst and killed him, it wouldn't be the end. Don't you think we live too much of our lives crippled by fear? Don't you wish we could stroll onto the battlefield singing Amazing Grace, knowing that no matter what happened to us, we would be all right? I think that's what the helmet of salvation can do for you. It can reassure you that your life is safe with God. You don't have to spend all your time worrying about it. You can focus your attention on other, more important things. You can take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Have you noticed that most of these pieces of armor are designed to protect us from the enemy? The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation. These are weapons of defense, but a sword, by definition, is a weapon of offense. It's what you fight with. So what do Christians fight with? The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. I would like to think this does not mean that we beat each other over the head with the Bible, or that we search the Scriptures to find those one or two verses that will cut our enemies off at the knees. I would like to think instead that it means we immerse ourselves in Scripture so deeply, so faithfully, that when we are called upon to answer our enemies, the word that comes from our mouth is the word of God. And the words are words of grace and truth and love. These are the kinds of words that will ultimately conquer evil. If we stoop to our enemy's level, we are no better than he is. But if we let the scripture lift up our souls to God's level, we shall overcome. And so the preacher comes to the end of his sermon. The letter of Ephesians comes to an end. The preacher closes with prayer. The congregation sings a hymn. And those freshly baptized believers go out into a world that will be hostile to them. But they will not go into that world defenseless. They will go as we go, armed with the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, and the sword of the Spirit. What can mere mortals do to us? What can the forces of evil do to us? If God is with us, then who can be against us? And so I say, lead on, O King Eternal. Lead on.